It's now time to turn our attention to perhaps the most famous fossil in the entire fossil record. And that's AL, or Afar Locality 288, Specimen 1, otherwise known as Lucy. Discovered in 1974, Lucy is a partially complete skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis. At the time, it was a major news story, and in the years since, Lucy has in fact toured the world's museums several times over. To understand Lucy's significance, we need to think of what she meant to the field of paleoanthropology in 1974. We already had a sense of what that last common ancestor with apes looked like, in the sense that we thought that the origin of hominins was associated with bipedality, perhaps canine reduction, but we didn't yet have the definitive fossil evidence to fill in that gap in the fossil record. We didn't have a combination of individuals that showed both bipedality and reduced dentition. Two years earlier than 1974 and 1972, individuals working in the same area in Ethiopia had recovered a specimen that included a distal femur and proximal tibia, which gave tantalizing evidence of bipedality, displaying the knee-in kind of morphology that we've talked about before with bipedality. But in 1974, the discovery of Lucy included not just postcranial evidence of bipedality, but also the cranial and dental evidence that goes along with both the primitive aspects of Australopithecines, but also the derived features, the reduced canine dentition, expanded molar dentition, and thickened molar enamel. All of this together made Lucy the first really great definitive representative of this tremendous gap between where we are now and our closest living relatives, the apes. What we'll do now is explore exactly how much information you can extract out of just a single fossil, in this case the partial skeleton of Lucy, AL288-1. Representatives of Australopithecus afarensis have been found throughout large stretches of the East African Rift Valley, but Lucy in particular was found in the Afar region of northeastern Ethiopia at a site called Hadar. The image on the left here displays one artistic rendering of what Lucy may have looked like. In thinking about the Australopithecines, filling in this gap between our last common ancestor with the apes and humans, one of the choices an artist like this must make is how ape-like versus how human-like to make the specimen. In this case, we see clearly evidence of the obligate bipedality that we associate with Australopithecines. You can see this in the foot, especially in the large toe, and its inline nature with the other toes. But there's also questions about the ape-like characteristics. As we'll see in Lucy's morphology, she's both ape-like and human-like in significant ways. Looking at the specimen itself, we have about a 35% complete partial skeleton of a young adult female. It includes a very well-preserved jaw, elements of the neurocranium, two relatively complete upper limbs, a partial thorax, very critically a pelvis, or at least a portion of a pelvis, a nearly complete femur, part of the proximal tibia and distal tibia, as well as part of the ankle. Within this assemblage are key elements that show evidence of bipedality. Recall that any kind of argument about behavioral or locomotor adaptation within a fossil specimen ideally generates predictions for not just a single skeletal element, but multiple skeletal elements. Part of what made Lucy so significant, and keeps her significant today, is that by being a partial skeleton, we can test hypotheses about locomotor behavior, not just by looking at a single element, but by looking at multiple elements from a single individual. This gives us the ability to check our own hypothesis with predictions on multiple elements. One way to understand Lucy is to compare Lucy to our skeleton today. Here we see Lucy alongside a reconstruction of a living human skeleton. And one of the first things you might notice is that Lucy is very small. It's estimated that her adult height was probably about three and a half feet, give or take a little bit, which puts her obviously considerably smaller, only about 60% of the size of humans today. Now, one of the things about Lucy's size is that, one, she's a female, and in, given the sexual dimorphism we see in apes, it's possible that her small size might be partly explained by her being a female, and that if we had found a male skeleton, we might have expected to see a larger size. As we'll see in the next unit, questions of sexual dimorphism in Australopithecus afarensis remain hotly contested today, with arguments about large amounts of dimorphism or small amounts of dimorphism both being advanced. To see this image in a slightly different perspective, we can see the elements of Lucy reconstructed on a theoretical framework for her body. This allows us to further explore the differences between Lucy and living human skeletons today. And what we can do is we can zoom in on some of these differences. So for example, here we see a zoom in on the pelvis, or what's preserved of the pelvis of Lucy. This includes the sacrum and a largely complete os coxae, as well as the proximal femur that goes along with that. These three elements give us the ability to get tremendous control over reconstruction of this portion and this critical portion of Lucy's anatomy.
Recall that in the transition from whatever our last common ancestor did in terms of locomotion to bipedality, and specifically obligate bipedality, the pelvis is a critical link. It ties together the upper body with the lower limb. And especially given the specialization of the lower limb associated with the pelvis and is associated with obligate bipedality, it's a critical element and one that's rarely preserved as well as it is in Lucy in the fossil record. And what this pelvis shows us is that Lucy had a very flared pelvis, much like the pelvis that we have today. If we look at the ilium of this specimen, we see that it comes very broadly. This gives the muscular attachments that allow bipedality in the bipedal gait to function. These are muscular attachments that keep your body from falling side to side when you walk bipedally and when you carry your weight across on a single foot. It also represents a shortening of the flattened, elongated pelvis that we see in chimpanzees and apes. Also in this view, we can see the femoral neck angle as well, which shows clear evidence again of this kneeing in, the movement of the weight into the midline of the body associated with the morphology of the femur. Again, strong evidence for bipedality in this specimen. One other element we can see in this view is a lumbar vertebra, or a portion of the lower spine. The lower spine is something that differs significantly between humans and apes, and this gives us at least some ability to reconstruct this area of the morphology in Lucy, or in Australopithecus afarensis more broadly. Moving in on other elements, moving down the skeleton, we can again see that we have a relatively complete femur preserved in Lucy. And again, in addition to the femoral neck angle, we can see that that forms a specific angle into the knee, the bichondrular angle, which again shows evidence of this kneeing in morphology. If this was a chimpanzee, or if this was simply an organism that was walking quadrupedally habitually, we would expect to see the knees out laterally on the body, instead of kneed inward like this, or towards the midline. Likewise, the proximal tibia, we can see that well-developed tibial plateau, much as we saw earlier in Australopithecus anamensis. Moving towards the upper body of Lucy, we can see a number of features of the upper limbs as well as the thorax. The upper limbs of Lucy are very well preserved and provide evidence perhaps actually of some retention of climbing ability in Lucy. One of the features that's been commented on is the relative breadth, in fact, of the distal humerus and the muscular attachments associated with it. This is a region that has muscles that, at least in apes that climb, suspensory apes, is very well expressed, associated with the muscular attachments in this area. It's possible that the breadth of this element within the Lucy skeleton also gives evidence of some retained ability to climb. Again, keep in mind that Lucy is three and a half feet tall. She lives in an environment that's full of predators, and she may not have been a very advanced tool user. She may not have been that highly social. We don't know those elements. So it's possible that returning to the trees, particularly at night to escape predators, may have been a key element of her adaptation. Looking at other elements of this picture, we can see that in this reconstruction of Lucy, at least, she has a triangular thorax. This, in fact, is a primitive feature. It's something that we see in the great apes today, who also have this shape of the thorax, the rib cage, and reflects both a reduced upper thorax associated with the lungs, but also an expanded lower thorax associated with a large gut area. Basically, apes given the low quality of diet they eat, require a long digestive time to process their food. They therefore need a fairly large or long gut or digestive system to process this. This reconstruction gives us an ape-like view of Lucy's upper half, suggesting that while her legs, her pelvis, her lower limb, and foot gave evidence of obligate bipedality, her upper half still retained many ape-like qualities, including perhaps the ability to use trees as locomotor resources, and also evidence perhaps of still reduced quality diet not yet a movement towards super high quality foods and therefore a need for a larger gut. Continuing to move up, we can look at a cast of Lucy's mandible shown here on the right, compared to that of a chimpanzee and that of a human. And again, we can see this combination of mixed and derived features in Lucy. In general, if we look, for example, at the anterior of the mandible, what we might refer to as the chin, although more commonly is referred to as the symphysis, we can see that it's intermediate between that of apes and humans. Apes have a receding symphysis. Humans tend to have a projecting symphysis, that feature that gives us a chin or a prominent chin. Lucy is intermediate in this characteristic. If we look at an, a superior view so that we can see the dentition, we can see again the characteristic U-shape to the chimpanzee jaw in this picture, and we can see that Lucy is beginning to move to a more parabolic shape, much like humans have today. So in this feature, Lucy is derived. Likewise, Lucy has very large molars, expanded molars, and especially increased thickness of the enamel on these molars. Again, a derived characteristic. 
In this case, Lucy is actually in some ways more derived from apes than we are today, in the sense that Lucy is both in terms of molar size and molar enamel thickness is greater than humans are today. Finally, we can see that if we look at the length of Lucy's jaw, it's very similar to what we see in humans. It lacks the long projection that we see in chimpanzees. This projection in chimpanzees is associated with the projecting rostrum or anterior portion of the skull. The jaw needs to fit the skull. So to fit the large projecting snout, you need to have a jaw that projects anteriorly as well. Lucy lacks this feature. All of these features indicate this combined composite nature of Lucy's skeleton. She's part human-like, especially in the morphology of her hips, her legs, and she's part ape-like, especially if we look at her upper half. So there have been arguments that Lucy actually moved with what's referred to as a bent knee, bent hip gait, something that's a different kind of bipedal gait than we exhibit as obligate bipeds today, even though Lucy was also an obligate biped. In addition to giving us a lot of information about Australopithecine biology, Lucy also gives us a framework that helps us better understand other isolated fossils. By containing elements of the skull, the upper thorax, and lower limb, Lucy allows us to look at the relative morphology of these elements within Australopithecus afarensis, helping us to put together isolated elements found at other localities that preserve fossils of afarensis. This is another important aspect of Lucy for our understanding of the fossil record.